Number 15, Carla Diaz Torrealba, also known as La Palua and La Granuda, or the hair in English. Carla Diaz Torrealba was known for posting seductive selfies on social media. She was often seen posing with guns in scantily clad outfits. But it wasn't all for show. The young woman was one of the most trusted associates of Venezuelan mob boss Carlos Luis El Coco Revete, who operates out of the country's capital, Caracas. According to local media reports, Torrealba used her feminine wiles to lure rival mob bosses to their abductions. As one of El Coqui's top-ranking lookouts, she naturally fell into the path of law enforcement as they attempted to close in on Rivete in July of 2021. By that point in time, Rivete had been wanted for over a decade. There was a $500,000 reward being offered for his capture, yet he managed to evade the authorities time and time again. Such was the case during the attempt to catch him in 2021. During a days-long shootout with hundreds of Special Forces officers, El Koki once again slipped through the hands of the police while Tori Alba was taken into custody. All things considered, the confrontation could have ended much worse for the young woman. At least 33 people died in the melee and there were rumors of police executing suspects on the spot. The glam gangster's current whereabouts and activities are unclear. Tori Alba has remained largely absent from news headlines ever since her arrest, suggesting that perhaps her short-lived career as a professional gangster has come to an end, although it's entirely possible that she's simply keeping a low profile. Number 14. The Murder of Rosa Sanchez Marino Mara Salvatrucha, better known as MS-13, is notorious for carrying out some of the most gruesome and horrific acts of gang violence the United States has ever seen. One of the most recent examples is the brutal murder of an 18-year-old woman named Rosa Sanchez Marino, who was killed around May 1, 2023, in Montgomery County, Maryland. The case remained unsolved until late September, when 23-year-old Roberto Rivera Delgado was taken into custody in Nevada for a parole violation. He was extradited to Maryland and reportedly led detectives to Sanchez Marino's body. Rivera Delgado and three other suspects were subsequently charged with first-degree murder, including 23-year-old Iris Alonso Salgado and 21-year-old Araceli Abarca Melgar. According to authorities, Rivera Delgado drove his accomplices to a wooded area in Olney, where they led the victim into the forest and forced her to her knees. The group proceeded to take turns slashing Sanchez Marino's neck with a machete before tossing her body into a shallow grave. All four suspects are being held without bail pending the outcome of their cases. Number 13. Daniel Medaya in 2009, a New Jersey man named Daniel Medaglia saw a potential opportunity to fulfill his long-held dream of joining the Italian Mafia. He did this by impressing his new friend, Michael Docce, who bragged about having connections to the mob. More specifically, Docce claimed to be an underboss to his uncle Pauli, who supposedly headed the Genovese family. He also told Medaglia a wild story about being kidnapped by a rival gang and held captive in a storage unit in Staten Island, and claimed that he had shortened his last name from Docesa to evade law enforcement and enemies. In reality, Docci had no Mafia connections whatsoever. He wasn't even Italian, but he went out of his way to keep up the ruse, including by introducing Medaglia to people he claimed were hitmen and loan sharks, and by calling him from blocked numbers pretending to be an old Italian man. On another occasion, Docci allegedly made Medaglia wait outside while he went around the corner to carry out a drug deal for hundreds of pills with a fellow mobster. Docci offered Medaglia a way into the family in 2011, when he identified Medaglia's good friend, Kelvin Dumo, as an alleged snitch who needed to be taken care of. At one point in time, the three men had worked together as pill dealers. The trio split after Dumo was arrested for drugs and realized that Docci was lying about being connected to the mob. When Docci offered to use his connections to get the charges dropped in exchange for $500, Dumo declined. By that point, Medaglia was fully convinced that Docci was a genuine gangster. He tried persuading Dumo to accept Docci's help, but it didn't work. 
Believing Dumo was a rat, Madalia lured his longtime friend to a marine terminal in Sayerville and murdered him with a pickaxe. The police were quick to narrow in on Madalia as the suspected killer and Dochi as the alleged mastermind. Finally realizing that his friend wasn't in the mafia, Madalia accepted that he had made a life-ruining mistake and pleaded guilty. He was sentenced to 30 years in prison and part of a deal in exchange for his testimony against Dochi, who also faced a murder charge. Taking the stand in his own defense, Dochi claimed that his fake mafia stories were a complete joke and that he never had serious intentions to harm or kill anyone. He said it was shocking how gullible Medallia was, and while it was funny at first, it eventually became a chore to keep up with Medallia's fascination. Dochi even said that he tried convincing Medallia that it was all a joke, only to be met with a response to the effect of, I know, I know, the Mafia isn't real, with a wink and a nudge. In 2017, Dochi was found guilty of conspiracy to commit murder and sentenced to 30 years in prison. He won a new trial in 2020, but remains incarcerated as of late 2023. Number 12. Letia Henderson and Kaylee Lee Ketley In early 2021, a 24-year-old Australian woman named Nisha Phillips was kidnapped by two wannabe girl gangsters who she thought were her friends. After getting into an argument during the early morning hours, 18-year-old Letia Henderson and 24-year-old Kaylee Lee Ketley stabbed the young woman as she begged for mercy. The suspects ignored Nisha's pleas to stop hurting her and forced her into the trunk of her own car while threatening to kill her. They then took a joyride and filmed Snapchat videos showing no concern for the victim's well-being as they sang along to the radio and smoked marijuana. Nisha attempted to stem the bleeding of her wounds using a shoelace as a makeshift tourniquet. At one point, her captors pulled over, stabbed her some more, and then continued driving around, making her feel even more convinced that Ketley and Henderson were going to make good on their threats to murder her. As she drifted in and out of consciousness, Nisha found the strength to continue fighting for her life. She managed to bust out one of the car's rear taillights and stuck her hand through the hole, waving frantically in an attempt to alert other motorists to her need for help. A police officer spotted Nisha's hand and pulled the vehicle over and asked the suspects who was in the trunk. The women played dumb, acting as if they had no clue someone else was in the car but the officer didn't buy it. He rescued Nisha, who told him she had been taken hostage after her friend's behavior went from zero to a hundred during a trivial disagreement. Henderson and Ketley initially pleaded not guilty to a litany of crimes, but they each ended up admitting to numerous charges in exchange for getting certain counts dropped. During their sentencing hearing, Henderson expressed remorse for her actions, which she blamed largely on childhood trauma, while Ketley's attorneys argued that she suffered from mental health issues. But the women's social media pages also showed an apparent affinity for the gangster lifestyle, with posts featuring pictures of guns, flashy cars, and hardcore rap lyrics. The court sentenced Henderson to seven and a half years, with the possibility of parole after five years, while Ketley received an 11-year sentence, with the requirement to serve more than six and a half years behind bars. Number 11. Robin Wilkin According to those who knew him, Irish truck driver Robin Wilkin had an obsession with organized crime. He reportedly had links to British gangs dating back to the 1990s and had a history of working as an enabler for London-based drug-selling groups. One fellow trucker told the Irish Sun that Wilkin talked a big game but could never back up his claims. The aspiring gangster also tried to form business relationships with powerful people, but many avoided associating with him. Wilkins was most recently arrested in 2021 when he allegedly tried to smuggle millions of dollars worth of cocaine across the famous Channel Tunnel among a shipment of Belgian chocolate. The arrest may seem like proof of his gang ties, but smuggling is low-level work, indicating that he was the designated fall guy for more important career criminals who were unwilling to risk getting caught. Wilkins was due to stand trial in October 2023, but he was found dead in July after being beaten and thrown off some cliffs in County Donegal. He had been reported missing several days earlier, after he was last seen enjoying live music at a pub and driving away with a man and a woman shortly after midnight. The trio seemed relaxed in surveillance footage from the bar. 
38-year-old Alan Vile and a female suspect are being held in custody on suspicion of murder as they await their next court date. For now, authorities are remaining tight-lipped about the circumstances surrounding their alleged involvement in the case. Number 10. Ryan Fortescue after separating from his wife of 18 years in 2016, 44-year-old Canadian paramedic Ryan Fortescue began dating a 29-year-old woman named Brady Elizabeth Cara Lavadure. He soon became a methamphetamine user for the first time, and within the next year he began catching criminal charges for financial crimes, including forgery, theft and fraud. Fortescue's downward spiral took a visible turn in 2018 when he and his girlfriend were accused of stealing hundreds of pieces of mail. They skipped court and law enforcement soon came knocking. During a raid on Fortescue's home in Manitoba, police found a sawed-off shotgun beneath Fortescue's bed. The weapon was wrapped in clothing supporting the Hells Angels, and officers found some other support gear throughout the home, including Hells Angels t-shirts. Lavajor was found hiding in the back of a hollowed-out sofa, and a couple were arrested on a multitude of charges, including gun-related counts. Following the arrest, Fortescue lost his job. He would later express deep remorse for ruining his career, claiming he no longer thought it was cool to wear Hells Angels gear. Yet he continued to glorify the group in his social media posts following his arrest. In 2021, Fortescue pleaded guilty to one count of unlawfully possessing a firearm. During a pre-sentencing interview, Fortescue's ex-wife described the defendant as a wannabe who was obsessed with organized crime throughout their marriage. She said Fortescue thought it was cool and liked the television shows and brotherhood of it. The wannabe biker was sentenced to two years of house arrest and three years of probation. During his sentencing hearing, the judge noted a concern over his unusual fascination with organized crime, but believed he did not pose a danger to the community under supervision. According to the Winnipeg Free Press, Fortescue has reportedly focused on turning his life around and now works as a painter and drywaller. Number 9. Ahmad Suhad Ahmad In 2017, a drug-addicted heroin user from Arizona named Ahmad Suhad Ahmad tried to finance his habit by telling people he knew how to build bombs. He offered his skills to a confidential FBI informant posing as a Mexican drug trafficker who claimed they wanted to kill a rival cartel member with an explosive device. The informant introduced Ahmad to a friend who happened to be an undercover FBI agent, and the three traveled to Las Vegas. Vegas, where Ahmad built two bombs and explained how to operate them. Not long after that, Ahmad was arrested on federal charges for heroin possession and distributing information related to explosives. In court, his defense attorney, Walter Gonsalves, argued that the defendant used his Middle Eastern background to his advantage, claiming he learned how to construct the devices during the Iraqi war, when in reality Ahmad had googled the instructions for how to make a bomb. Gonsalves depicted his client as a wannabe gangster who resorted to desperate measures to fund his drug and alcohol addiction. But the prosecution was quick to point out that Gonsalves acted with the understanding that he was arming a dangerous person who wanted to commit a murder. Ahmad pleaded guilty to the charges and was sentenced to three and a half years in prison. The judge also ordered him to undergo substance abuse treatment and offered a stern caution that if Ahmad fell back into drugs, he would end up back in the courtroom and that the judge would send him back to prison. Number 8. Albert Rapofsky A drug-fueled gathering of wannabe thugs took a deadly turn in 2016 when one of the young men accidentally shot his friend in the face. 20-year-old Albert Rapofsky and his buddies were partying at a hotel room in Melbourne during a night that seemed to begin innocently enough. At some point, they decided to pose for photos in their underwear with a sawed-off shotgun while trying to act like gangsters. One of the attendees, 22-year-old Mohamed Hassan, urged Rapofsky to unload the gun to avoid an accidental discharge. A group member removed two magazines from the gun, but nobody took care to ensure that it was fully unloaded or that the safety was on. While pointing the gun at Hassan's head for a selfie, Rapofsky accidentally pulled the trigger. The bullet struck Hassan in the mouth and neck area, killing him instantly. Rapofsky panicked and fled the scene. He got rid of the gun, which was never found, and tried fleeing to Macedonia, telling a travel agent that he needed to travel urgently to his sick grandmother. Border officials apprehended him at the airport, and he eventually pleaded guilty to manslaughter. 
Rapovsky hadn't slept in four days and was reportedly high on GHB and methamphetamine at the time of the incident. For this reason alone, he should have known that he was in no condition to operate a gun, according to the judge, who described the defendant's actions as nonchalant and arrogant. According to Australian news outlet The Age, Rapovsky also did not have a gun license and did not know how to properly use the weapon. The judge further criticized Rapovsky for leaving the scene, noting that he had a moral duty to stay even though there was nothing he could do to help her son. But he was credited with being genuinely remorseful and for having good prospects of rehabilitation, earning him a sentence of eight years with the requirement to serve at least five years in prison. Number 7. Jordan McSweeney 35-year-old aspiring lawyer Zara Alina was walking home after a night out in London in June of 2022 when a stranger viciously attacked her from behind. The assailant pulled her into a driveway and assaulted her as she fought for her life. After kicking, stomping and beating the victim for nine minutes and returning several times to continue the attack, he fled the scene. A couple found Alina struggling to breathe as she lay dying on the pavement. The young woman died from her injuries despite the best efforts of Good Samaritans and emergency responders, who spent more than an hour trying to save her life. Nearly 50 injuries were identified on Alina's body, including blunt force trauma to the head, bruising to her face, and deep cuts to her scalp. She also suffered from a traumatic brain injury. Police identified the suspect as Jordan McSweeney, a habitual offender with dozens of convictions on his record. His rap sheet included priors for burglary, assaulting police, and racially motivated crimes. He had a disturbing history of violence against women and had recently been released from prison when he murdered Alina. On the night of the killing, he was kicked out of a bar for harassing a female employee. He proceeded to follow four more women before committing the fatal attack. In the years leading up to Alina's murder, two of McSweeney's ex-girlfriends accused him of domestic violence. One of the women, Samantha Bryan, described the accused killer as a wannabe gangster who stomped on her so hard that he left his shoe print on her face. She endured McSweeney's abuse for four years before she finally escaped. Brian reported her ex to the police, but ended up dropping the charges against him. She told the Daily Mail that she just couldn't follow through with the case, but said she regretted failing to do so after learning about Alina's murder. Six months after the brutal slaying, McSweeney pleaded guilty to assault and murder. He was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 38 years. Number 6. Colin Coates during the late 1990s, highly successful Scottish IT specialist Colin Coates was overtaken by the same type of arrogance that plagues many people who might be considered new money. Also, like many wealthy young people, he began drinking a lot and developed a cocaine habit. This combination of factors led to an explosive temper and abusive tendencies, and as a result, Coates lost all the trappings of his success, including his celebrity hairdresser wife and most of his hard-earned fortune. Over the years, Coates was arrested for beating up his wife, attacking a fan of a rival sports team at a pub, and assaulting his sister-in-law and a good Samaritan who intervened. He was also suspected of burning down his ex's house, but the case was dropped due to a lack of evidence. During a flight to Spain in 2009, Coates erupted into a cocaine-fueled tirade, announcing that he was a gangster and spewing threats at innocent passengers. He threatened to burn one woman's house down and to throw acid in another woman's face. Coates made off with just a fine, but it was not the last time he would grace news headlines for his outrageous behavior. A few months after the plane incident, Coates befriended Linda Spence, a serial fraudster who touted the false image of a successful businesswoman. Desperate to restore the wealth he had lost so he could go back to living an upscale lifestyle, Coates scrounged up some of the little money he had left for a property investment that Spence promised would come with a big payout. But the return never came, and in April 2011, Coates realized he had been fleeced. Determined to exact revenge, he lured Spence to his flat where he and a co-conspirator named Philip Wade were waiting with a sinister plan. The men forced Spence into the attic, bound her to a chair, taped her mouth shut, and forced her to wear a pair of glasses with the lenses covered with tape. Over the next two weeks, the men subjected Spence to prolonged torture using bolt cutters, a golf club, cigarettes, a clothing iron, and other objects to inflict excruciating pain. 
They smashed Spence's knees, cut her thumb off, and inflicted other agonizing injuries in hopes of getting her to reveal what she had done with Coates's money. Coates and Wade summoned the help of two additional men who stood guard over Spence in between torture sessions. They eventually killed Spence, and her body was never found. After the murder, the men deep cleaned Coates's apartment in an attempt to get rid of evidence, but they missed a spot of blood which tested as a positive DNA match to Spence. During the suspect's trial, witnesses testified that they were intimidated into remaining silent about what they knew. The men who stood guard over Spence for Coates and Wade claimed they were afraid to release the victim because they feared what the suspects might do to them. Meanwhile, Coates denied having any involvement in the victim's disappearance, even though all signs pointed to the contrary. He claimed that he had provided Spence with a safe house to stay at when people were after her for conducting bad deals, and that she just vanished one day. Coates was found guilty of kidnapping and sentenced to 11 years in prison. When he finally confessed to Spence's murder, he offered to help authorities locate her remains, causing her loved ones to get their hopes up about the possibility of finally giving her a proper burial. But a search of the location Coates provided turned up empty-handed, and authorities have failed to identify a promising location for a second search, leaving the victim's family to grapple with an ongoing lack of closure. Number 5. Luke Gould Throughout 2014 and 2015, a teenage British man named Luke Gould committed a string of violent crimes against innocent victims in Cheshire, England. In one incident, Gould pointed a realistic-looking BB gun at a teenage victim in the town of Runcorn. In a scene later described by a judge as resembling a horror film, the young man tripped and fell while attempting to escape on foot. Gould and his co-conspirator chased after the victim and held a fake firearm to his head, then began pistol-whipping and stomping on him. When two bystanders tried to intervene, Gould turned the gun on them and threatened to blow their heads off if they called the cops. The victim later told police that he thought the suspects were going to kill him. He suffered a broken nose and ended up needing stitches for his injuries. Less than two months later, Gould and another accomplice tried to rob two brothers using the fake gun. Instead of backing down, one of the victims grabbed Gould by the throat, punched him in the face, and lifted him up and slammed him into the ground. As he fled with his tail between his legs, Gould fired the BB gun, striking the other victim in the midsection. During police questioning, Gould and his buddy claimed that one of the victims produced the gun, but the weapon was found in Gould's yard and he was charged accordingly in connection with the crime. He skipped his court date and proceeded to commit five robberies over the next several months, while on the run. In July 2015, Gould threatened a store clerk with a machete. The victim was so traumatized he sold his business. Gould also stole a bicycle from a teenage boy he robbed at knife point and held a blade to another victim's throat during another armed robbery. Police eventually found the suspect hiding under his bed cover. During questioning, Gould claimed that voices in his head had egged him on to commit the crimes. His attorney told the court that his client suffered from mental health and substance abuse problems and that he had started smoking weed as a child. In 2016, Gould pleaded guilty to two counts of having an imitation firearm with the intent to cause fear of violence, assault causing actual bodily harm, perverting the course of justice, and five counts of robbery. While handing down a life sentence with a minimum of six years, the judge administered a stern caution that the teen would not be released from custody unless he is deemed to no longer be a threat to society. If and when he sees freedom again, he'll spend the rest of his life on probation. Sure enough, Gould served a handful of years and was cut loose, only to become wanted again in 2023 for violating the terms of his release. As of April 2023, he remained on the run and was believed to possibly be hiding out in Wales. Number 4. Harry Sonny Hamonda a falling out between two young men from Cardiff, Wales spiraled out of control in early 2021 when one of the parties decided to take their behavior to a criminally threatening level. Harry Sonny Hamonda and Ryan Matthew Storm were once close friends, but they became entangled in a petty tit-for-tat for reasons that were never revealed and began exchanging nasty messages on WhatsApp. At some point, Storm blocked Hamonda in an attempt to put the feud to rest but Hamonda wasn't ready to let it go and began harassing Storm through social media. 
The fight went on for months before Hamonda sent Storm a video of himself shooting what appeared to be a gun out his car window while driving. Before pulling the trigger, he uttered a threat to his former friend, using slang to refer to the gun. During a search of Hamonda's home, police found a large amount of marijuana and two legally owned airsoft guns. After determining that the gun in the video wasn't a real firearm, authorities charged Hamonda with drug possession with the intent to sell and having an imitation firearm with the intent to cause fear of violence. He pleaded guilty and received a suspended prison sentence along with community service. Hamonda was also ordered to undergo rehabilitative treatment and was banned from contacting Storm for five years. The judge minced no words while handing down the sentence, describing the defendant as a naive idiot rather than a real gangster. Number 3. Mason Armsden McLennan In November 2018, an 18-year-old British man named Mason Armsden McLennan and an accomplice violently robbed a pair of party guests at a flat in Leicestershire, England. Armed with machetes, the young men cornered the victims on a balcony and forced them to strip down to their underwear. The thief stole the victim's clothing, shoes, a watch, a cell phone, and the keys to an Audi, which they used as a getaway car. During the robbery, Armsden McLennan allegedly told the terrified victims that they had crossed onto his turf and they didn't belong in the area. The stolen Audi was later found abandoned and damaged beyond repair. In a previous robbery a few months earlier, the teen made similar comments after asking a friend to give him a ride somewhere during the early morning hours. During the drive, Armsden McLennan began making comments like, I'm the boss around here and this is my estate. He tried to choke the victim, who briefly fell unconscious and threatened him with a screwdriver before speeding off in the man's car, which was never found. Armsden McLennan was young, but he already had a lengthy rap sheet detailing numerous failed court interventions which were carried out in an attempt to straighten out his wayward behavior. Despite these failed efforts, the defendant claimed during his trial for his most recent batch of robberies that he truly wanted to change. Yet he couldn't even handle hearing the truth about himself from the judge who asked Armsden McLennan if his crimes were worth it and told him to stop bullying people. The troubled teen lashed out, telling the judge that he hoped he died and calling him an inappropriate name. He was sentenced to seven years in a youthful offender facility. Number 2. Azim Issa A British man who was known for calling himself a gangster on social media lost his temper on an epic scale while playing video games with his friends one day in April 2016. 22-year-old Azim Issa wanted to play an Ultimate Fighting Championship game, but his buddies wanted to play a FIFA soccer game. To get Issa to stop whining, the friends gave him a marijuana joint. Issa was probably already in a bad mood over not getting his way when his pals mocked him for losing a match against 28-year-old Sahil Roy. Several days later, he dropped by Roy's house in London. They were hanging out like normal when Issa allegedly got upset with Roy for refusing to give him a cigarette. The men soon began exchanging your mom insults. Issa apparently took Roy's commentary to heart and lost his temper, fatally stabbing Roy twice in the head and neck with a switchblade. He then fled the scene while Roy bled to death and was later charged with murder. In court, the prosecutor accused Issa of seeking out Roy, who appeared to be avoiding him after their argument a few days before. Issa argued that Roy charged at him in a fit of rage and that he had stabbed his friend in self-defense. But it was Issa's temper and his habit of carrying a knife that the judge blamed for the deadly altercation. We have another great video lined up right after number one. If you need more of a daily world list dosage, then be sure to stay tuned if you haven't seen that one yet. Number 1. Kai Connor Before he decided to become a real criminal, 19-year-old Kai Connor shared photos and videos of himself wearing a balaclava and acting tough with guns and machetes on Snapchat. The following month, he led law enforcement on a high-speed chase in Manchester, England, while driving a BMW with fraudulent license plates. He blew red lights and drove erratically, forcing other drivers to veer out of the way to avoid being hit. Officers managed to stop the car after chasing the teen for 10 minutes, prompting Connor to flee on foot, tossing a machete along the way. During a search of Connor's home, police found a gun, ammunition, and gun cleaning kit stashed in the backyard, along with marijuana and painkillers. 
Investigators also searched his sister's phone, which contained internet searches for things like how to remove fingerprints from a gun. And of course, police found Connor's collection of photos and videos of himself trying to act like a gangster. The teen's DNA was found on the weapon and Connor was found guilty of drug and gun possession. He was sentenced to five and a half years in prison and banned from driving for nearly three years. Connor's sister, Amy Patterson, was sentenced to one year of supervision, including three months on an ankle bracelet with a curfew and was ordered to complete 25 days of rehabilitative activity. Number 10. Permanent Marker Masks the award for the dumbest yet most creative criminal goes to both Matthew McNally and Joey Miller, the two guys with perhaps the worst master plan in history. Matthew and Joey were a little bit hard up on cash and couldn't afford the traditional burglar outfits, meaning no black suits and no black masks either. So they did the next best thing. They painted masks over their faces using permanent marker. Of course, the permanent marker didn't do so much to cover, well, anything really. They looked exactly like normal, except covered in permanent marker. So how did they get busted? Police stopped their car after somebody reported two men with paint on their faces trying to break into a house in Iowa. The caller told the police the two suspects were wearing dark clothing and that they drove off in a white car. The white car was a 1994 Buick Roadmaster, not exactly the most inconspicuous vehicle for doing a robbery. After the police stopped the car, they found the suspects with beards and mustaches drawn on their faces. How old were these brilliant burglars? Well, they were in their early 20s, but that's not really an excuse for such an outrageously bad idea. Both were charged with attempted burglary, they never actually managed to steal anything, and the driver was charged with a DUI. Hopefully by the time they have their day in court, their disguises will have washed off. Number 9. Out of Gas In Berry Hill, Tennessee, a police chase came to a rather underwhelming end. It all happened on a Monday morning when a man named Richard Ewing walked into a shop and flashed a message written on a piece of paper that said, Quick and easy, give me cash. Richard then said he had a gun and went behind the counter and stole cigarettes and stuffed his pockets full of cash. But according to the investigator with the Berry Hill Police Department, Richard didn't even have a gun. He was faking it. He also stole a handful of lottery tickets as he ran out the door. Richard got into his beat-down old minivan which he had parked at the car wash and then drove down the road without his headlights on. Unfortunately for Richard, he pulled into the main street right in front of a cop. The officer flashed her lights but Richard kept on going. Within just 60 seconds of chasing Richard, he came to a slow stop and pulled over on the side of the road. Much to his dismay, he'd run out of gas. There wasn't much left for Richard to do at that point. He got out of the car, acted confused, asking the officers what the problem was. He was even quoted as saying, Why are you guys jamming me up like this? Well, Richard was arrested and he was taken into custody, and he went to jail on charges of aggravated robbery. Number 8. Florida's Dumbest Criminals Two men have just been dubbed the dumbest criminals in all of Florida, and yeah, that title is pretty spot on. Robert Hobby and Marcus Reeves are not the brightest bulbs in the cupboard. They went on a crime spree and left behind a trail of evidence that allowed the police to track them down and arrest them with shocking efficiency. The crime spree happened inside the city limits of Ocala and in the surrounding county. The pair broke into a handful of convenience stores, looted cigarettes and lottery tickets, and were having a grand old time. But as they were breaking into these convenience stores, they were being recorded by security cameras. They were also smoking cigarettes inside the stores and leaving behind their cigarette butts. But that's not all they left behind. Police officers also discovered a shoe that belonged to one of the criminals, and Marcus Reeves at one point dropped his wallet that had his driver's license in it. All the police had to do was look at the address on the license, drive over to that house, and then knock on the door. Marcus confessed immediately, and then both men were arrested. These two lazy criminals were then charged with 14 counts of grand theft and burglary. In court, there would be no denying their participation in these crimes. The evidence was beyond overwhelming. Number 7. Robbing the Dollar Store so if you were to embark on a brazen daylight robbery, you'd probably pick somewhere better than the dollar store. But Matthew Allen Harvey from Timmonsville, South Carolina had his criminal eyes set on a dollar general, pretty much the opposite of a place you'd want to rob. According to the police reports, Harvey walked through the door of the dollar general, strolled around for a bit as if he were shopping, then approached the counter and placed the items down by the cash register. He told the clerk to ring up the items and open up the register. Once the register was open, Harvey demanded all the money from the drawers but no change or $1 bills. Demanding no $1 bills from a literal dollar store seems ridiculous, but that is what happened. 
We don't know exactly how much money Harvey got from his robbery, but it couldn't have been much. Even dumber than robbing a store that probably has less than 50 bucks in the register is that Harvey left all the items he had touched on the counter. Investigators easily lifted his fingerprints from a bottle of dishwashing liquid and then arrested him just a handful of days later. Why do you think this guy chose to rob a dollar store? Let us know in the comments below, and if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. Number 6. Premature Confession James Washington was an inmate in a Nashville prison when he suffered a seizure and thought he was going to die. The sentence James was serving was from a second-degree murder conviction in 2006. He only had to do 15 years in jail and probably would have been out earlier on good behavior, but after his seizure attack in 2009, he thought it was all over for him. So to get his conscience clean before he died, James admitted to a murder that he had committed in 1995. He would apparently murdered a woman named Joyce Goodner. The crime was never solved. The woman's body was found stabbed, beaten with a cinder block, stuffed inside of a carpet, and burned. And he'd gotten away with the crime for 17 years. James thought he did a good thing by revealing the truth. He'd be able to go into the afterlife with a clean slate, though to be quite honest, I'm not really sure how that works. In any case, he recovered fully from his seizure. James was given a clean bill of health and a positive outlook on living probably for another 25 or 30 years. Unfortunately for him, his sentence was increased to life in prison, and now he'll never see the light of day again. At his trial for the 17-year-old murder, James claimed that after his seizure he was hallucinating and that the confession wasn't real. Prosecutors didn't believe him, and according to ABC News, the court very quickly convicted him of the murder and kept him locked up tight. Number 5. Failed Payout A couple tried to burn down their house and collect the insurance money. This isn't exactly a new crime, the insurance companies are pretty used to dealing with claims like this. But this investigation turned into something absolutely bizarre. It all started with Carol Ann and her partner Laura Jean Stutt. The couple had accused one of their neighbors of vandalizing their property. A rather nasty word was written on the white facade of their garage, something most people would consider a hate crime. After the hate crime was recorded by the couple and reported to the police, their house ended up being burned down. The couple blamed their neighbor Janice Millsaps, saying she'd burned down their house because of their sexual orientation. And in today's climate, that seemed legit. With their house in ruins, the couple was hoping to collect the insurance payout of over $275,000, and that's a handsome sum of money. Naturally, the neighbor denied having anything to do with the fire or any related hate crime. The police investigation and the insurance company's investigation uncovered that it was actually Carol and Laura who had burned down their own house. They have since been charged with arson, and because, well, they didn't have a house anymore, they're both homeless criminals. Talk about a plan backfiring. Get it? Backfiring? Number 4. The Fake Cop A man in the Bronx was pulled over by police while driving at around 1 a.m. in the morning. The man's name was Mata Jones, and the reason he was pulled over was that his windows were tinted. They were so tinted that they were in violation of the law. And this in and of itself isn't that stupid of a crime, a lot of people actually do this. The stupid part came after when the police realized Mutta Jones was impersonating an officer. He exited the car wearing a Kevlar vest labeled police. He also had a police badge hung around his neck on a chain. Police believe he was imitating an officer to commit home invasions more easily. Obviously, the cops didn't believe his disguise for a second. He didn't hold himself like a cop. His disguise was actually ridiculous to anyone who'd actually ever seen a real cop before, and the whole thing fell apart for Mr. Jones. According to the New York Daily News, he was charged with possession of a weapon, oh yes, there was a 9mm handgun under the driver's seat, and criminal impersonation, forgery, and a handful of other offenses. Number 3. KFC Bomb Threat Two teens have been arrested for the stupidest prank ever. These kids were only 18 and 16, and they thought it was hilarious to call in a bomb threat at their local KFC restaurant. It may have been funny for them, but it was terrifying for the employees of Kentucky Fried Chicken and their customers. The KFC had to evacuate everyone in clothes, and while this was happening, the rambunctious teenagers were driving through the streets, firing a BB gun out their window. They actually managed to injure somebody in the street by firing a fake gun at them, and they even blew out the windshield of a parked car at the Walmart. The kids may have been just messing around, but the cops took it very seriously. The older boy was charged with the false bomb threat battery, criminal mischief, and shooting an occupied vehicle. The other kid was charged with accessory and handed back to his parents. The 18-year-old was held on a bond of $9,000 and will probably do some time while the other kid goes home and gets grounded. Number 2. Facebook Busted A man named John Morgan II is definitely one of the dumbest criminals ever. 
The first dumb thing he did was rob the savings bank in Pickaway County. You either have to be Jason Statham or really stupid to rob an actual bank in 2021. It wasn't a great decision, but what's really crazy is that John may have gotten away with the brazen crime had he just been a little more discreet about it. After taking all that cash home, John decided to brag about it on the internet. He took to what has become the downfall of many dumb criminals over the past decade, Facebook. He uploaded posts of himself all over Facebook, holding up the loot he took from the bank. He took selfies of himself with a fat stack of cash and uploaded them for roughly 6 billion people to see. You know who saw those photos? The local police. John was arrested and sentenced to three years in prison by Judge P. Randall Neese. The judge also ordered that John repay the roughly $6,000 he got from the bank, but the story isn't over yet. John was assisted by his equally dumb girlfriend, Ashley DeBeau, who also pled guilty. She was charged with being complicit to the robbery and sentenced to serve two years. She was also sentenced to help her dumb boyfriend repay that $6,000. Number 1. Back to Jail in Arkansas, a man was released from police custody. This is supposed to be a happy day for a criminal, and to be the day he vowed to turn his life around and never go back to jail. Well, Cordell Coleman was not that kind of criminal. He walked outside from the jail, took a look around, and decided he would steal a cop car. That's right, he walked out of prison and stole a cop car before even going more than 20 feet. It was 2.40 in the morning, and Cordell drove away from the Pulaski County Jail in a very clearly marked 2018 Ford Explorer cop car. How exactly did he get into the car? An officer had just pulled up and was booking a prisoner. He hadn't expected someone to get into his unlocked car and take it. He walked back outside to find his patrol vehicle gone. As you can probably imagine, the cops are pretty good at tracking down their own stolen cars. They got Cordell before he had even gone 10 miles. They actually found him parked outside of an apartment complex, still sitting inside the vehicle. He was arrested and then returned to lockup, and this time they're probably not going to let him out. Thanks for watching. At one point or another, almost everyone has tried a little too hard to impress those around them. What's the most cringeworthy thing you've ever done in an attempt to be cool? Let us know in the comments below, but be sure to subscribe first. See you next time. Bye.